Okay, so let, let me start now. So I was asked uh, to speak about the mathematical theory of randomness, or it's called algorithmic information theory or algorithmic randomness theory. And uh, it's a mathematical theory, but uh, I, I probably will more speak about the, the, the philosophical, philosophical reasons why we need such a theory. And uh, le let me start completely philosophically. So uh, what is the nature of science and what kind of prediction the science makes and how we check these predictions? So uh, for example, uh, there was a big uh, and very impressive advantage of uh, Newtonian mechanics. And uh, it's, it's kind of a uh, uh, miracle, really. You can predict where all the planets, where the moon or uh, Venus or uh, everything, you can predict where you can see them for, for, for hundreds of years uh, with very high precision. So you can, obviously, it was a big, big achievement. Nobody can do it without the theory, but then you see that they exactly do whatever, uh, whatever the uh, uh, scientists tell you. But uh, there is also another kind of science, which is uh, uh, another kind of uh, phenomenon. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if we have a, a, a piece of a radioactive material, uh, we know that it will decay with more or less known speed. But what we cannot say, if we take one, it's, it's quite possible to detect uh, the decay of one specific atom. So you can mm, mm, have a small, uh, small piece of uh, uranium, and then it, it makes these clicks at, at, at the counter. So you know more or less when they will happen, uh, how many of them will happen. But you never, uh, modern science is unable to predict exact moment. So the question is, what, what does it predict then, if you cannot say it uh, exactly? So what, what are the prediction of probability theory? What kind of, no, probability theory is a mathematical theory, but also it's applied to some uh, real phenomena, and then it, uh, they should we have some predictions. And the question is, what really, what really uh, how we check these predictions? So there is a, a story um, of games. So the, the, first, uh, the first reason to study probability theory were uh, the games of chance. And uh, f f uh, it's quite probably now uh, uh, people uh, re realize, even if they are gamblers, they realize that they are just a kind of, 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 of sport. Uh, but uh, even um, 150 years ago, uh, the greater, great Russian writer Dostoevsky uh, was in playing in a casino in Baden-Baden. In so I, I didn't dare to translate the, the, the Russian quote uh, for, uh, of, of great writers. But still, what, what he says, that he, st he, he started playing and uh, won a lot. And just, uh, uh, he, he, he get, it was a rather, rather big amount. 100 guldens was something significant for him. And then he wanted, and he was in, in debt, so, so he really wants to, to, to win. And he believed that if he will be very uh, careful, very calm, uh, without uh, too much, too much uh, excitation, then mm, for sure, and it, it, it's even wrote, uh, underlined, uh, without any doubt, we can win as much as we want but we need to play for a long time and very carefully with small bets and avoid be, being uh, uh, too, too risky. And he explained that there is a Jew who, 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 who is able to do this and he always wins and the casino is, is uh, afraid of him. So uh, it, it was his real belief, I guess. I don't think that he wanted just to, to, to fool his wife uh, he really, really thinks that there is a system, there is a strategy which allows him to win. So it's not, so, now probably it will be more, more uh, suspicious, but for him I think it was completely sincere belief. And uh, the question is, what is, this, what is randomness? What, what, what do we know about randomness? So, for example, 
Uh, usually people say that the, the, the exper experiment shows that when we uh, perform a coin tossing, there are random bits with a, a probability one half, equal number of heads and tails. But what does it mean? So this is a kind of scientific theory. How can we uh, confirm it? And what, should, what kind of experiment should we do uh, uh, to check this? And mm, the simplest possible experiment is just to make a large number of coin tossings and say and check that heads almost half of them. Uh, but it's not all uh, what we expect really. So if, for example, if we toss a coin and get 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, we will, will not believe that the coin is random. We will say that, uh, for example, if, if the casino uh, uh, gives a 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 pattern, then of course you can easily win if you play every second time. So uh, not only in the, in the original sequence that it should, there should be the same number of heads and tails, but also if we try to select some special uh, places when we uh, make bets, also for the special places, if they are selected before the game, of course, for the special places, the number of zeros and ones should be approximately the same. And this was the idea of the first, first person who decided to uh, define a notion of random sequence. Uh, it, it was a German mathematician, Richard von Mises, and uh, he called it collective. I, I cannot say it in German, das collective probably. And uh, he said that the, the collective is a, a, a sequence when we have some fixed, num fixed frequency of zeros and fixed frequency of ones, and this remains true if we select uh, some subsequence according to some rule. And he was not very clear what kind of rules he allows, but at least it was the first, first mathematical, first attempt to give a mathematical definition of an ind individual random object. Uh, so uh, somehow we look at one specific protocol of uh, uh, transcript of an experiment uh, we, and we want to say, to make a judgment, do we believe that these numbers were produced by random coin or, or we don't? Actually, it's not so easy. So we, we, once we, I, I was teaching at some uh, summer school for, for high school children in France and uh, we, we get a kind of a competition. So the competition was like this. So the, the, the participants had to write two hundreds of zeros and ones. And then they should make it randomly. So they should make it random looking, as random as, as, as they can. And also, uh, they can toss a coin and produce other, other sequences just by, by re real coin tossing. And it's quite quite uh, easy actually using some simple program to, to find some parameters and to find out whether the students really tossed a coin or produced a sequence fr fr from the head. So of course, if you are um, an educa educated person, you can have some tricks to produce a sequence. For example, if you remember the digits of pi, uh, binary digits of pi, probably our program will not be able to, 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 to find it. But if you just write 0, 1, 0, 1, and believe to, want to avoid any, any regularities, actually there are some regularities, and you can, you can check this, and uh, uh, students were qu quite, quite um, surprised that they, their best attempt to write something looking random were not, not, not enough to, to do it. And also, uh, actually it's not, again, it's not so obvious, uh, about randomness. So the, 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 the question, if we toss a coin uh, 10 times and we have nine ones, uh, uh, does it, um, how does it change our uh, prediction for the 10th tenth, tenth, uh, coin? So uh, the modern uh, physics or modern probability, probability theory as an experimental science says that it really doesn't matter. So even if we have ar arbitrary uh, prefix of uh, arbitrary string uh, as uh, before, we cannot say, it, it doesn't change if we know the string, we cannot say anything about the, the, the next bit. And so, for example, uh, you cannot really uh, win a game in a casino 
if you decide to play, for example, if you bet on, 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 on red after you have three reds, for example, or if you have after three greens. So every, uh, every thing in the past doesn't influence our chances for the future. And also there is, a, if we speak about great writers, uh, maybe not so great but, uh, uh, as Dostoevsky, but still, th there is, so the question is, if, if we, for example, if we have several, several tales, uh, uh, this information, does it uh, make our chances to get a tale bigger or smaller? And uh, now we, we, we say that it's no, but, uh, which means that, for example, if we, if we look at the long sequence, uh, then we have the same number of 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 blocks. So every, actually the, what the modern probability theory says about a coin, that every uh, sequence, for example, with five bits, there are 32 of them, and every, all, all of them appear with the same frequency. But it was not so obvious uh, just uh, last century, uh, the, the two centuries ago. So mm, there is a, another quote. Now it's fortunately in English. It's it's a, a kind of story of of a detective story. One of the first uh, detective uh, crime. Uh, I don't know how to say detective writers, uh, and uh, Edgar Poe, and he 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 wrote. I don't know why he started to speak about this, because it's not, it has not, not much to do with the story. But he explains a strange thing. He explained that normal people believe that the past events have no influence on the future one. As, as we know now, it's, it's our current belief. But then he says that, uh, in fact, it's not the case, he, he, he thinks. And moreover, this, why it's not the case, it's very difficult to uh, explain. So I don't know what he meant about this difficult explanation. So, but he says that all the people are stupid because they believe that the, the past events change the probability of the future one. Uh, but they, they don't believe that the past events change the probability of the future one. And he knows that it's not the case and they do influence. But it's strange. Again, maybe it's a kind of, 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 of a practical joke. I don't know, but still, 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 he writes in a very solemn, solemn way his strange, <laughs> strange opinion. Okay, but let, let, let's start, ask a question in a bit of different form. So you may, usually what, 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 how the science should work, uh, the scientific people have some hypothesis or theory, and this theory makes some prediction, and then an experiment, you can make an experiment to confirm or to refute this prediction, and if, if, if you refute them, you construct a new hypothesis, and then you uh, start again. This new hypothesis makes new predictions, and uh, you make new experiment, and uh, this experiment again probably uh, uh, refutes your theory, and you change the theory, and so on. This is at least how in popular books they explain how the science works. But, mm, Let's look from this viewpoint, we can look on probability theory. So we, are, we have a conjecture, a, a statistical model for a coin, and this statistical model says that uh, the coin is random, so uh, e every combination of bits uh, appears equally often. So, but imagine we toss a coin and get such a sequence then it's quite natural to say that, look, no, this coin is not random. But the question is why? So uh, why this is, uh, uh, why if, if we see 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on, we will not believe that this is a result of a, a real experiment. As with the students, somehow you will say that, no, you cheated, you didn't do your homework properly, you didn't toss the coin 100 times, you just wrote 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and it's, it's just your, your uh, false, false uh, results. But it's not so easy to explain why we, don't, why we come to this, this thing. Of course, we can say that this uh, sequence has a very small probability. So uh, we say that, no, it's not possible because the probability to get the sequence is very small. So if, if I am not mistaken, there are 13 bits. 
So the probability of getting the sequence is very small. It's 2 to the minus 13. And the problem is, uh, of course, that if we have any other result of the experiment, of course, this other result also has the same small probability. So if we think that this probability is small enough to reject the hypothesis, uh, then why don't we reject the hypothesis uh, in the other cases? And it's, it's quite a serious problem. In, 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 for example, in, in, in biology, we have some experiments, uh, they, they, or, or, or in, in medicine, they make some trials. For example, they want to know how probable is that, for example, this kind of new drug doesn't help much, and the difference in, 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 between the numbers of people who uh, are alive without this drug and with this drug is just a random, uh, a random deviation. And they, they have some, as a rule, something like p-value. If they say that some, uh, this null, null, null hypothesis say that there is no statistical difference and they check that this uh, observed event has a small probability, uh, actually they use something quite, quite uh, uh, large like uh, 5% is a st standard p-value. So if they make an experiment and something happens which has probability smaller than 5% under, under the null hypothesis, then uh, they say that probably the, the drug is really does something. And, but also it's, it's, it's difficult because, of course, if, if after the result or after the experiment is done, you can... Uh, Say that it's very uh, uh, that it's very small uh, small probability event to, to see exactly this result of this experiment, and so in 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 the, in the biological science the uh, golden rule is that you can reject the hypothesis only if you formulated this hypothesis before the experiment. So if you make an experiment and then try to 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 um, argue about your hypothesis. And you did not uh, uh, write, uh, uh, didn't write down the hypothesis, then you, uh, this is a bad practice. But of course, it's very difficult to, 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 to check. You, you have some mm, people in the lab, uh, they produce some experiments, assuming that they're not cheat, they have some real data. But then they publish a paper. How can we know whether the, 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 the theory was uh, before the, the experiment? Of course, uh, they, they observed that they didn't, didn't invent the theory out of the blue. They just looked at some experiment, find the theory, and then check the theory with other experiments. This is what they should do. But how do we know that this last experiments were made after the theory? And this is, this is a big problem in, in life sciences. For example, now, now there is some rule that you should register, register somewhere what you will do, and only, only if you do it before the experiment, then you can write a paper after the experiment. But it's also not, not a very good solution. Uh, we have a big, if you, if the, the biological sciences is a huge factory. There are hundreds of researchers in, in any laboratory and millions in the world. So um, they came with different hypotheses. And of course, if we uh, uh, say that one, one over uh, five percent is, is okay, then probably one of, of 20 researcher will write a paper even if there is no effect whatever. So, uh, and, and it, of course, if, if, if you have no effect, you don't write, the paper is not published. And it, so you have just a, a, a steady stream of false paper uh, just because of random, random uh, lack of, of, of this researcher. And also, it's a bad idea, so you, you need to, to be very careful and, to, 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 for example, you can, it's very important to repeat the experiment in other laboratories to see whether they are really, really uh, reproducible. So here, here is this paradox in a, in a most uh, clear form. So our statistical hypothesis says that every, every sequence of zeros and one has the same probability. And then somehow, still, we uh, 
say that some outcomes, some observations are inconsistent with this hypothesis. For example, the 0, 1, 0, 1 uh, somehow disproves a hypothesis. And why? Why the others, which have the, exactly the same probability, uh, uh, cannot do this? And the answer is more or less uh, the, uh, that this uh, 0, 1, 0, 1 is a so simple pattern that we can uh, specify it in advance. Or we can imagine that someone specified this in advance. But if we have some other pattern, of course, if somebody could specify this pattern in advance and we toss a coin and we see that the coin exactly follows what this person gave us as prediction, uh, we will say that no, the coin is not random, even the, if the sequence looks, looks normal. Uh, but the, the importance is that we have either a simple hypothesis which we can think of as, as given in advance to, uh, or is uh, just actually given in advance even if it's not simple. And so this, this is, this is uh, but it's rather strange. Uh, somehow the, our belief in the hypothesis depends on when we learned about it. So imagine somebody wrote a, wrote a letter and uh, we make an experiment while, while the letter was uh, in the mail. So should it should be considered as it making before or, or, or after the experiment. Pro probably if we believe that the letter was posted before, it should be uh, okay. But sti still it's a bit fishy. And uh, there is even more, more ways to explain this paradox. So uh, there is actually a book which was published in the 1940s, I think. And it's a large book. And you can even buy a copy, original copy of this book now in, in, in Amazon, or I don't, rem I don't remember exactly. But I looked, and you can buy an original copy for like $1,000. It's quite expensive. But there are also rep cheap reprints of this book. But what is this book? It's just full of page like this. I just made a small uh, uh, picture of a small part of, of page two. So here is, is just the line numbers, you see. And here are kind of random digits. So they made some machine using some electronics. It was quite difficult because at that time they have almost no computers. So they need to make an electronic device and then convert this into uh, punched cards and then do something with this punched card. But anyway, they did this. And they, they produced uh, such a sequence. They, it was not bits. It was just uh, digits. And they, the book is li like this, like probably 100 page or 200 page. And you can see that they indeed look quite, quite random. But now let's, let's make a mental experiment. Imagine you buy such a book. And then you see that there are only zeros. And can you go back to the company and can you uh, sue them for, for sending you a false book? And uh, it, it, it should be quite, quite uh, convincing that if you have zeros, probably the company was cheating on the la in the, or in the last moment. No, it, it's, it's quite stupid to cheat in this way because it's obvious. But probably in the last moment something was wrong with the machine and they didn't check it and so on. And, uh, but still, what you can say to this, what you can say to, to the judge, why you complain. Of course, this sequence of all, all zeros is a very improbable event. But any other event like a book like this is also very improbable. So why you can complain in one case and not in the others. And uh, the, the modern answer to this question, because the sequence of zeros has a very short description you can think about this description as existing before the experiment. And so this, if the experiment gives something which uh, was predicted or could be predicted before, uh, it's uh, fishy. And of course, nobody will can uh, uh, imagine that someone predicted exactly the same book. So if, if indeed some other company published the book before and had exactly the same digits, you can probably uh, complain f for an uh, illegal uh, copyright violation because uh, it's highly improbable that they exact get exactly the same digits. But, but you cannot, uh, if you see just digits alone, there is no reason to complain. 
So another, another story, I'm, this, this I'm not completely sure, but at least I learned from, from Lotman's commentary to uh, Yevgeny Onegin that how in, in, in uh, old Russia they, they played the game. Uh, maybe it's not, not Yevgeny Onegin, maybe it was about the, the, the Queen of Spades. Okay, but that's but definitely Lotman. The, they, they, th they have the, the card decks. They didn't use the same card deck twice. So they just uh, bought a clean deck and then started to play with it. And when they finished, this, this uh, deck was considered as used. And it was given to servants, to, to peasants. It was not good for noble people to use the same deck twice. And the decks were pre-shuffled, so the, the, the order was random. So there was some kind of, there is a factor which produced these this decks, and also there was a kind of, probably it was not machine at that time, it was some person who made shuffling. And of course you need some quality control. So if, if this per, uh, shuffling person is lazy and doesn't shuffle really, you should somehow detect this. But it's not clear what is the quality control. You should somehow declare the decks, some decks has, is invalid, but all the decks have the same probability, all the orders in a deck have the same probability, so there is no reason to, 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 to be suspicious. And again, the second question, imagine you come to the casino and you see that the sequence of red and green is not, uh, is too regular, you believe it's too regular. Can you get a, a reasonable case in the court uh, when you can Proof that they are cheating. And also, again, it's not obvious what kind of the argument you can provide in the court. And it's not, not, not really a very theoretic, theoretic thing. So, for example, there is a well-known... So, 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 let me say, the question is, we have an individual object, like a sequence of bits. Can we say, make some judgment, look, it's random or not random? What, what do, how do we really can define this mathematically or practically, and this is not only a theoretical question, because there is, there is a kind of picture from the, from the uh, uh, official data, I, I think from, from 2000, 2008, 18, I guess. So this, there are, for every polling station, there is a point. The point is the, is the percentage of, of, of how many people came to voting, and uh, how many of them voted for Mr. Putin. And just every, every polling station is a point and you get a big picture. And of course you see that this picture is not uh, rather strange. There are lines here and there are some kind of a grid. If you just look from, from large distance, uh, you clearly see the, the, the grids here. Uh, and uh, this looks very suspicious. And of course people make complaints that uh, this is just cheating, and they have, uh, how, how, you, you should have just some polling stations where they were instructed to write 85 persons, and they do it. So it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it appears more often than all other numbers, which should not happen for, for a reasonable, reasonable random process. So, but also, it's, it's kind of statistical argument. So theoretically, uh, this outcome also has some positive non-zero probability. And uh, how can you, how can you uh, argue about this in a convincing way? And, and of course, it's not, not the question for, in the Russian card you cannot argue anyway, but uh, still, still, still theoretically it's an interesting question. And uh, here, I think there's, now there is some kind of uh, mathematical theory which uh, if, if doesn't, it doesn't give the full answers, but at least it provides some language to speak about these questions. So this is uh, one of the probably most uh, famous among its f uh, inventors, Andrei Nikolaevich Kolmogorov. Here is, he is speaking with, with children in this Kolmogorov boarding school uh, in, in Moscow, I guess, or maybe in some participant of some Olympiad or, or whatever. And um, another, another guy, no, he, he was, uh, he's very well known as a, as a mathematician. He has a very bad luck of, of uh, writing a school textbook for geometry 
which everyone then complained that nobody can understand what is a, a vector because a vector is a mapping of a plane into itself which uh, uh, transforms the line into a parallel line. And of course, the idea of a mapping uh, is not very clear for, for the, for the uh, audience. And even the, the teachers, or maybe especially the teachers, couldn't understand this. And so it was a disaster. But still, still mm, no, his mathematical achievements are uh, in, very, in many different fields and very well known. And uh, this was his last, this random theory was one of his last uh, uh, discoveries. And there are other people, uh, very interesting, interesting selection of them. So there is another a person, Gregory Chaitin. He is alive now. Uh, he is quite old, but he is alive, and he is mm, explains that he is the great man. He invents all the theory. He didn't want to mention Kolmogorov even. Uh, 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 he was, uh, and he is very good at at, at um, advertising. So you see the the picture of a great philosopher thinking about the. Uh, there is some omega number of Chaitin which contains all the, all the information about the mathematical object and world. So it's, it's kind of a bit of over, overdone, I guess, this advertisement. But still, he, he has some very important technical achievement. Uh, he he uh, discovered some notions, actually rediscovered them because there was mm, mm, some pe people who uh, did this before. So two of them. It's Ray, Ray Solomonov. It's a scientist in uh, United States in Boston. Actually, he was kind of a very interesting person. He was almost, almost. He was a um, not homeless, but he has no job. He he started some company, uh, one man, one man research company, which is he he was of Russian origin, but maybe far. But I don't know why he called his company Zator. But, okay, it was one make man company, but he got some mm, contracts from research agencies, and he wrote in, in the beginning of, of 60s, he wrote some uh, papers uh, in, in which he somehow discovered uh, what Kolmogorov discovered later, the notion of Kolmogorov complexity. But he was an engineer. No, actually, he's very, he was a very nice and person, and I... Mm, I have even seen him in some conferences, uh, uh, but when, when he was already very old. But mm, as a mathematician, uh, mathematicians were very angry because uh, in his uh, this is a quote from his paper, and he wrote some equations, and they explained that maybe they are incorrect, but then you should change them somehow, and it's more important to keep something correct than the, some other things to be correct. And of course, the mathematicians who read paper like this uh, say, look, what is this? This is just a guy who doesn't understand what is mathematical reasoning. What is this? But still, if you read carefully and ignore all this and try to get, make sense of what he writes, and you read all, all the papers uh, fully, you can find very interesting parts when he actually uh, defined this notion of Kolmogorov complexity before Kolmogorov. Actually, not before Kolmogorov. Maybe he was at the same time, but Kolmogorov published later. So somehow he is, if we, if we mm, are careful we can, and read all the small parts, small passages in his paper, we can say that he was the first inventor of the theory. And Kolmogorov later knew, uh, b became uh, aware of, of uh, his work and cited his, his paper always. So, so there is no uh, question of priority but just interesting. And so the idea is, what is the individual random object? It means that there are no uh, regularities. There is nothing uh, special in the object, nothing uh, which we can observe in this object and s describe in a simple way, uh, which, which uh, separates this object from the majority of objects. So if we, for example, if we have a sequence of zeros and ones, and the, the fraction of zeros is for uh, close to one, we have almost all zeros, only few ones. This is a regularity which is easy to describe. Uh, uh, we can imagine that it was discussed before the experiment, or it maybe actually 
discussed before the experiment. And then if we see this, we see that there is some regularity, and we say that the sequence when we have majority of zeros, big majority of zeros, is not random. And uh, what, what Kolmogorov and Solomonov noted, that this regularity somehow uh, says that the sequence is compressible. If we know that there are only few ones, we don't need to, to, to write all the zeros and ones. We can use some, no, now we can use, just use some zip program to compress it, but also you can have a short description that I don't you know, uh, uh, 133 zeros than one, uh, 257 zeros than one. And this is much shorter than the, the, to describe the sequence uh, bit by bit. So uh, mm, randomness of an individual object is the absence of regularity or uh, absence of a short descriptions. So more formally, you can say that the complexity, complexity of a bit sequence is the minimal length of the program which generates the sequence. So for example, you can uh, generate the digits of pi, uh, the, mm, trillions of digits of pi by a short program and even reasonably fast program. So the pi is uh, the, the, the initial, initial segment of binary uh, pi is not uh, a random sequence. It has a lot of, it can be compressed significantly. And uh, so this is the first, uh, uh, this is probably the, it's one of the manuscript. It's not the first paper of Kolmogorov, but one of the first paper. Actually, uh, I even have physically have the, in Moscow, unfortunately, I physically have the copy of this paper because when Kolmogorov was old, uh, he, was, uh, he was actually in a quite bad condition. So one of the students should always be near to help in some kind of, of emergency or if he cannot move or he has a Parkinson disease, so it was very difficult for him to move. And at, at that time he prepared, uh, the paper wasn't published in time, it was for, for 1970. But then he, 30 years later, not, not 30 years later, uh, uh, 20 years later, it was uh, prepared for publication. And uh, I was just at the same day uh, when, when, when he prepared this for publication. And then there was a new copy, a clean, clean, because you see that he just write it with, with a typewriter. And when he changed his ideas, he just uh, changed, crossed this out. So it was just the, uh, uh, the first, really the first, it's not, not the copy of something, but just what he, what he write when he thought about this. But then he threw, Elmogorov threw this away in, in a garbage can. And I cannot resist, so I, it's, it's kind of a museum object. So I, I, I secretly took this thing for a garbage can. And, and now it's in, 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 in I, I put the copy, digitized form in, in archive org. So, uh, uh, but here is the explanation here. The complexity, I don't know whether you can see it, but the complexity of a string X uh, is a minimal length of a program P, uh, which uh, being sent to a universal, uh, so to our programming language interpreter S produces no, here is a number of x because it was at that time the programs usually produced numbers in, in mathematical theory, but but still it's just the, the shortest program, minimal shortest program which produces x. And uh, so he, he, here is the first first definition. And uh, later, just few years after Kolmogorov gave this definition, there was another guy, uh, uh, Pierre Martin Leuf. Uh, uh, he came to Moscow. Uh, uh, it was quite strange story because he he he, he was studying uh, uh, studying Russian language as a kind of military military training. Of course, uh, at the, it was sixties, so uh, people in Sweden were at that time they were quite afraid of some Russian invasion, and so they they thought that if the invasion happens, you need people who speak. Russian who can understand something what happens. And so he was having military training and learned Russian because of that. And then he decided that it's ni nice to use this knowledge somehow. And he decided to come to Kolmogorov and um, actually Kolmogorov gave him some problem from mathematical statistics, uh, which uh, he solved, I think, but, but it was not something exciting for him. But there was a seminar 
organized by Kolmogoro for, 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 for his Russian students uh, about complexity, and Martin Löw became aware of the theory, and he invented a definition of infinite random sequence. So, of course, if you have a finite sequence, like, I don't know, you, can ask, you cannot ask for a sequence of 10 bits whether it's random or not random. Of course, every, if, if you just uh, change, change one bit, it doesn't change much the randomness. So uh, it's a kind of a paradox of, 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 a, of a heap. You, you change bits, at some point it becomes non-random. You cannot say exactly when it happens. But for infinite sequence, you can define, a, 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 de, have a strict dividing line between random infinite sequences and non-random infinite sequence. And this is what Martin Löw, Martin Löw did. He gave some definition in terms of measure theory. He said that the random sequences are sequences which do not belong to a set of effective measure zero. So it's a technical thing. I, of course, I would be happy to explain this, but it's uh, another story. I just want to say that Martin Löw gave the definition for infinite sequences. And uh, later, mm. so he, tech, he somehow he was a student, or um, now it would, he would, he, he, we would say he's a postdoc. But uh, then Kolmogorov appreciated very much his work. And, uh, uh, but initially the topic was different. It was his initiative to, and also maybe you know that he was one of the, uh, after that he became one of the inventor of what is called intuitionistic type theory. And this theory was one of the inspirations for the, this language for proof checking, which is called Koch and quite popular, especially in France. So he, he has a probably bigger influence on practical, practical computing in this way. And uh, there is another, another guy from, from Germany, Klaus Peter Schnorr. Uh, he is also known in, in cryptography and also uh, so, so uh, uh, probably better known in cryptography. But also he d gave a definition of randomness in terms of games. So uh, uh, he proved somehow that the sequence is random if and only if there is not a computable strategy which, which wins uh, systematically against the sequence. It's kind of uh, if and only if criteria, if you uh, are careful and, and do it in a correct way. And also there is another uh, guy who worked in this field, Leonid Levin. Uh, he, was a student, he was really a student of Kolmogorov from the very young age. He, 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 he studied in this uh, Kolmogorov Internat, uh, the boarding school which was uh, founded by Kolmogorov in, in, in Moscow. And he, he was then Kolmogorov student as a student, as a graduate student in university. And of course, he, uh, uh, at that time you cannot, uh, it was very difficult to defend uh, a, a PhD thesis in Moscow if you are a Jew. And he was even worse than a Jew. He was also kind of uh, a dissident. So he, 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 and he was especially dangerous kind of a dis dissident because he infiltrated somehow the, the, the Komitet Komsomola, uh, the, the uh, Young Communist Party Committee of the Moscow State University and make troubles internally of, 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 of this, this, this. So he, he was hated by all the Soviet authorities. And later he tried to defend his thesis, not in Moscow, of course, it was impossible, but he went to Novosibirsk with letters of Kolmogorov and very, very, very supportive opinions of the reviewers and everything was perfect, except for Levin, who was completely so bad that this perfect, perfect uh, reviews cannot help. And, and this was, uh, I, I think that the, 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 the chairman of this committee was uh, really a uh, good, good Russian mathematician, Yuri, Yuri Leonidovich Yershov. So it's a kind of, uh, he, later when he went to United States, there was some kind of protest explaining, look, you are, you are uh, responsible for this thing. But, it's, it's, it's not clear. But Levin told me that he, and in fact, uh, he should be. Uh, so there was one thing, uh, I, I, he, he, I, I asked him what he, what he thinks about Yershov, and he said that first, Yershov has to do this. You cannot be a Soviet mathematician of any standing without participating. You, you cannot refuse this. 
But there was one thing which, which Yershov uh, did uh, beyond the strict duty. He also wrote in, in kind of a review in, in the decision of the committee that uh, some kind of political statement that Levin is not, uh, not just the, way the paper is weak, but just Levin is, is somehow bad. And this way, in this way, uh, this prevented Levin from getting any job in Russia. But then he, Levin says he should be grateful to Yershov because this, and after that he finally decided to, to go to the United States and he uh, luckily he get a decision and the permission to do this and get a very good uh, job. Uh, yeah. And of course he much better paid than Yershov's job. And, uh, <laughs> and of course the most important thing, he was member of the community and he did a very important work about holographic proofs which is now PC, which is a some some step in PCP theorem, and also in, in other in other in important work, uh, there is kind of very important paper of Levin in Pagliazzo Lubi and 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 okay uh, just just uh, Hastad yeah so that there is a paper of, of how to generate um, uh, uh, random bits from from slightly random bits so so how to generate one way function from 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 some construction which is called one-way function. But anyway, this, he, he, he proved that a sequence is, is random if and only if the initial parts of the sequence can be compressed. So somehow there is, there is one uh, very na naive way to understand randomness, uh, but almost correct, that random a sequence is a sequence which cannot be compressed. So you can, uh, how to prove that the sequence is not random? You just run some program like zip or gzip or, 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 or any other compressor you like, and if this program uh, really compresses your sequence, uh, uh, of course lossless compression you should be able to reconstruct exactly, then the sequence is not random. And uh, we can define a complexity as a compressed size. Of course it's a bit, it's an upper bound because uh, these com compressors use only some type of, of, of regularities to get a compressed version. So maybe the, there is a deep structure in the sequence which is not uh, available to the compressors, so the, the complex, uh, real complexity can be small, but compressed size can be large. For example, if you compress this pi, uh, digits of pi, you don't have a good compression, but we know that there exists a deep structure just too deep uh, uh, to be discovered for, by the compressors. And uh, there is kind of uh, law of nature, just a very, uh, in, in a very classical sense. So the law of nature is that if we take a, a re coin and produce a sequence of, I don't know, million uh, coin tossing, and this uh, sequence will not be compressed uh, uh, with zip or, or gzip. No, significantly compressed at least. So, for example, to have a compression by 1,000 bit, uh, uh, which is just one uh, uh, promille of a million uh, bit sequence, if this has probability 2 to the minus 1,000 more or less. So even a small uh, fraction of compression means that the sequence is not random. And mathematicians just say that most sequence in uh, mathematical theorem is just the most sequences are incompressible. But uh, kind of uh, natural science, real life things, we believe that if we toss a coin and then apply zip, then they will not uh, get any uh, compression, significant compression. So you can check your um, coin in this way. And what is actually you can ch check not only the coins, you can check uh, some hardware random generators, and this is actually how they are checked. So you can buy some device for you can buy it for for hundred dollars or for 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 thousand dollars or for ten thousand dollars. There you have all the spectrum of these things, and because it's quite difficult to to check it. It's actually the cost, uh, quality, and, and price are not really related. So we made some experiments. There was kind of project in our laboratory. We just bought different, different uh, available commercially uh, devices. One of them was very expensive. It was from Switzerland, used quantum mechanics and, 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 and so on. But the quality is worse 
than from other devices, which is much cheaper. So uh, it, it's and, and the test. There is another story. The tests are not. There is a special program for testing, but it has many errors. So there is another story with, with problems, but still, still. So philosopher can think now. What is this law of nature that we cannot get a coin gives us something incompressible, whether it's true or false or how we can prove it. It's clear how can we, do, how can we disprove it because you can just, if you just make some experiment and get a non compressible sequence, then you somehow disprove this law of nature. But um, up to now there are no, no uh, experiments like this and how to prove it, 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 it it's not clear. How can you cannot really prove that something incompressible? There is you, uh, there is some even some mathematical results. So there is a known theorem of Gödel, which uh, he, he invented a lot of things. There is completeness theorem and incompleteness theorem, which confuse people. How you can prove completeness and incompleteness at the same time? But it's of, of different things. And there is uh, he proved that uh, you cannot prove that the, the formal theory are uh, consistent. So you cannot prove that you cannot prove a to false statement. And also he proved that axiom of choice and uh, continuum hypothesis are compatible with uh, set theory if the set theory is consistent by itself. And he, he also, there is a, a change in form of Gödel theorem. So if we say, if we toss a coin uh, uh, a million of times, and then they say the complexity of this uh, String exceed, I don't know, five five hundred thousand. Of course, uh, we believe that it's practically true. It's not it's so so improbable to get a compressible sequence that this should be true. But still, uh, you can prove that uh, uh, this statement statement saying that the specific sequence has very high complexity. This statement is not provable. So it can and it can be provable only if the slower bound is very small. Not very small, but, but several thousand. Or it depends on the theory and how we measure complexity, but it's like thousands or tens of thousands, but not millions. And so this, this, in, we can get easily get a statement which is true, but not provable, but just by tossing a coin and then claiming that the thing is incompressible. And this, this is the Gödel theorem in, in Chaitin's form. No statement of this, po this form is provable, and actually you can, to prove this, uh, there is, it's kind of a version of a paradox. There is, there is a paradox which is called Berry paradox. Just consider the, the minimal number that cannot be described by 10 words. So of course, uh, some integers can be, ca can be described by, by a sentence, but we have only uh, uh, not so many sentences with 10 words, so there should be some number which cannot be described and take into some natural number which cannot be described. Probably which I, should, I should write natural number of 11 words. But still, 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 still it's... Uh, and then we get a contradiction because we somehow described something which cannot be described. And if you formalize this argument, you get the Chaitin version of Gödel theorem, and this is quite easy argument. And I, I want to finish with kind of practical application of Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, it's not really application of Kolmogorov complexity, but it's a kind of, mm, 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 now probably it's completely outdated uh, and, and people know how to have much better things. But th there was just an experiment in the middle of, I think, 90s. So uh, the experiment is in this. He took some uh, objects. Uh, here, is, uh, here is, I think it's, it, it does it from for, uh, yeah, from musical from musical files. So he took a MIDI files of different composers, and then he tried to classify it as you do, for example, for uh, for um, animals. So how close, are, how similar these files are to each other, and uh, of course you need some way to measure the similarity. Uh, you can do it. Uh, carefully looking at what are the structure of these files, what kind of the parameters they have, what is the, what is the typical patterns, and so on. But what he found, that you can do it in a very, uh, very simple way. 
So how you measure whether two uh, MIDI files are uh, close to each other, are similar. And this is, can be done by kind of information distance. And uh, the idea is very simple. So let's compress uh, X separately and compress Y separately. And then somehow these two, two uh, compressed versions determine X and Y. Uh, but we also can compress uh, the sequence X, Y as an, uh, one big sequence. And if they are similar, then this compression of a big sequence mm, will be shorter than the compression separately of X and then Y. Because X and Y have some common uh, patterns, and so the compressor, which um, starts, for example, by compressing X, now knows something about frequencies, about this or that, and when it starts compressing Y, it starts more efficient way than if compared with the, the case when the Y is compressed starting from the, uh, from the beginning. And so it, what is, you don't need to learn anything about uh, MIDI files, you can do it. So they applied the same program to MIDI files, to uh, novels, uh, to, uh, I think it, there was kind of a pandemic, not, not there was kind of virus uh, discovered like, like uh, swine flu or something. And they was, uh, it was uh, sequ sequenced, but uh, it was published. And just a day after it was published, they applied their program without any adaptation and find that this virus belongs to some family. And later, of course, the biologists also do this uh, with much more uh, advanced methods, but still you can, you can start with very simple thing to get some immediate results. And this is, this is a kind of practical application of, of Kolmogorov complexity. Not, not probably now really practical, but at least you can it has a lot of interesting mathematical application. That's why it's interesting. But if, if you are pressed to, say, to explain why it's important for the real life, you can tell the story, and then you should not tell that it's not the, not, not now is not used. But it was interesting anyway. Okay, so thanks for, for, for th that's what I want to tell. I, I don't really know what, uh, what kind of things uh, you, you were expecting from me, but this is just a kind of very high, high level view, what happened in the uh, randomness theory, and uh, what were the mm. motives, wh why people started to look at uh, this notion from the philosophical point of view. And now it's a quite significant and interesting mathematical theory of complexity and randomness, which I almost, al al almost didn't touch, of course. But uh, it's a very interesting mathematical theory. There are applications to combinatorics, uh, to probability theory. To, for example, there is a proof of what is called Lovas local lemma uh, using, using complexity. So there are many interesting mathematical applications of this, these notions, but still motivation was philosophical. So thanks again and uh, for your patience. <laughs> yeah.